The life of a call girl undoubtedly seems an attractive mystery to the public at large, informed by lurid novels and occasional newspaper headlines. Her earnings are thought to be astronomical, her life one of glamour and ease. How does the call girl get started? What is her day-to-day -day experience? What rewards do her profession offer her? This report attempts to examine some of these questions. In the vernacular of the prostitute, entering the profession is known as being turned out. I turned myself out to get out of this damn town. That was about seven years ago. And I told my roommate I, I needed money to buy a ticket. And she said, well, I know a guy that'll give you your ticket. She didn't mention what I'd have to do in return. I was so naive I didn't even ask. Well, he was an actor, a big name, and, and I went to his house and I was shaking like a leaf because well, I loved him on the screen and I thought, oh, he was a, I was young and he was a, a big deal, you know. And he was going to give me my ticket back home. So, well, I get to his house and he's, he's playing cards and he's got some other girls out there and they were talking about turning tricks and I thought, what was that? I'd never heard that expression before and, well... I didn't want to act like I was an idiot, but I didn't know, so well, finally I, I got the picture. Well, the guy started leaving and going into the bedrooms with the girls, and so he says to me, and well, it's about one o'clock now, I said, well, you're going to spend the night, so just relax and I'll, I'll tell the others they can leave. Well, I wasn't used to drinking, and I'd had about three drinks, so I was practically passing out, and I didn't care about anything. So then everybody leaves the room, and this guy makes a pass at me a real pass, and I screamed, and, and he got mad, and he said, you're going to get your ticket back. I want you to go back. You're too naive for this town. What are you doing out of here anyhow? You told me to go home with your mother. In a couple of years, you'll be old enough to come out here, but right now, you're going to be caught for being out after curfew. So then I started to get scared, because he, he, he was mad at me, so he says, listen, I, you go in that room and take your clothes off, and I went in the room, and there was another girl there, and she says, get your clothes off and go back in there. There were all these big towels hanging in there. You know, I said, the, can I put this around me? And she says, no, go on in there. I said, I can't. I was petrified. I thought, oh, just, just let me wire my mother so I can get out of here. So I said, I couldn't do that. I've never done it. And she says, come on. And she, she shoved me into the room. So, so he says, well, you better go on upstairs to my room. I'll he said to her, you take me upstairs, and he knows I'm scared, and he says, go to bed. Then he went downstairs and stayed with her for a while. And he came back and spent the night with him, and we had sex two or three times that evening. And actually, I'd, I'd had sex before, but never with a man that old. And I never did leave. I never went home. I got the money for the ticket, but I never went home. I had been in this country six or seven months. I didn't make a dime and I didn't try to work. I was studying acting. I was broke, but I knew some people and I had room and board for free. They helped me out a little bit and I went to school in the day and goofed around a little bit, you know. And I took a little modeling job here and there. Not much. You can't live on that. It's too little. And I am too tall to be able to do anything, really. Acting deals and things. Most guys are too short. Uh, I never intended to be a big actress, anyway. To be a big star or anything. I had a language barrier that I had to overcome to be able to do anything. And even if I did overcome this, I am very limited because of my height. When it comes to pictures, there are so many girls anyway, so why should I try? So I needed money all of a sudden. Actually, I was spending a lot of time doing social work, when you think of it. I mean, not charging money. I knew there were a lot of married guys who wanted to pay to have an affair with a girl so they wouldn't be obligated. A friend offered to introduce me to some of these men. It was repulsive the first time but I just cut out everything that had to do with feeling. I lived with one guy for two and a half years. I didn't have anyone else. Oh, I would have been a damn fool, too. He was loaded. And I had everything I needed. 
But then I came down here and I decided I was going to be really square, so I went to work. But after having money, you just can't go to work. It kills you. You get your paycheck at the end of the week and you look at it and you say, damn it. <laughs> I worked all week for 60 bucks, less than I could make in a day. So now I'm really hustling. I've only been at it a few weeks, but I've managed to save quite a bit of money already. I'm pretty careful and I don't expect to get busted by vice. I only take customers through people who know them, all about them. Only the greedy girls get arrested. Uh, I was working as a hostess in a restaurant in Detroit. Major D came up to me once and asked me if I'd be interested in entertaining one of his customers. Mm -hmm. uh, I was kind of scared and didn't really do it, but uh, so I says, okay, for $100. So he says, okay. So I had to stay with the guy all night. And after that, why, the bartender got me a lot of jobs. Uh, even though I was picking up $100, I still kept my job as a waitress. Some call girls make their profession seem like light, pleasant work. I don't have to punch a time clock. I don't have to work eight hours a day. I'm lazy. That's, that's why I'm selling myself. I never have liked work since I was a kid, during the Depression days. Remember those days? Mm -hmm. well, I'm not happier making the money I make now, rather than the money I made when I was legit, but as long as I'm working, I figure I might as well make as much money as I can. But all call girls have at least this one important problem. Every time a new guy calls, we worry he's a cop. I've only been busted once, but I'll never forget it. I've been in the business about six months, and I met this girl. And she says, come to my place. I can make you $50 every afternoon. I said, wow, this is fabulous. She was a madam, and she wanted me to make tricks. So I went over to her place and turned three there, right in the afternoon. And I did get 50. So I went on for about three days. Well, she called me one night to come over. She said there would never be any nighttime business, because her husband is home at night and she don't conduct anything. She said the trick would take 20 minutes. So she gets her husband out of the house and she says to me, start getting undressed, so when they come we can get them out right away. So I says, okay. I kept my dress on. You know, it's kind of one of those sack dresses, loose cut. So when you take the belt off, it just hung down. And I took my underwear off, and I was standing there, and these five guys come in. So she pulls one guy aside. She says to him, what goes? So he says, these are my friends. We want you both. Just like that. I had just started to unhook this thing in back and take off my belt. And this guy comes over and pushes me down on the bed. I thought, oh my God, he's drunk or something. And I started getting a little perturbed, and I'm looking over at her, and she's hiding in the corner against the wall and giving signals to me. <laughs> so I'm trying to pull my dress up, and she's still making signals to me, and I don't know what's happening. She was trying to tell me it was the vice squad. I had this long, long hair, and I looked about 16. And the guy takes my hair like this and says, Come here. You're going to juvenile tonight. I didn't know what anything meant. And I didn't know what was going on, so I spit in his eye. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Don't pull my hair. And with that, he says, Okay, come on. He says, Do you know what's happening to you? You're being arrested. I said, For what? He said, For what? So he says to her, Tell her for what? She says, Don't say anything. He had placed the marked money on the table, you know. So I said, you had nothing against me. You got no case. But they took me down to jail, and I stayed there uh, for days, it seemed. All this happened four days before Christmas. I spent Christmas there. They didn't let me out of their sight. This one cop, the guy whose eye I spit in, really had it in for me. He really gave me a rough time downtown. He couldn't forget that I spit in his eye. All night he talked about it like he had it in for me, and he hoped that I got convicted. Well, he got his wish. The judge found me guilty. The cops proved the case when they left the money on the dining room table, and I took the belt off just as much as to say, let's go. They proved it then, and there were four others who were watching. To the call girl, the client is known as a John. A call girl rarely lets a John call her directly. 
She's learned to avoid the authorities by having all her calls come through a telephone answering service. She keeps a list of clients known as a John book. When a client calls for a date, his name is checked against the book. If he's in the book, the call girl knows he's safe. If he says he's been recommended by someone whose name is in the book, he might also be safe. But if his name isn't in the book, he probably won't have his call returned. Her John book is one of the call girl's most valuable possessions. The names in it are worth money to her and to other call girls. A girl's John book is worth at least a couple of thousand dollars and sometimes a lot more. It's worth it even if you can get only a couple of good guys out of it. Mm. Uh, let's say I have a, a pretty good number. I mean, a, a phone number of a guy who doesn't want me anymore. Well, he's going to move on to somebody else, and, and he's worth plenty of cash to whoever gets him. A girl's John book is subject to theft by other call girls. To forestall this, or at least to punish the offender, a clever girl always pads her book. That is, she includes the names of several vice officers. Anyone trying to make contact with one of them will land in immediate trouble. The extent to which the John Book is symbolic of the call girl's entire way of life is illustrated by this girl's reaction to its loss, even though she thought she had no further use for it. I wanted to quit. I burned my John Book and my bank account with it because I wanted to be so pure. Uh, I even went out to the incinerator and, and put my New York book and my Hollywood book together and threw them both in. And as I watched it uh, burn, I almost fainted. I, I almost had a heart attack. At the time, I didn't think I'd ever be a call girl again, but four months later, I was back at it. I never let anybody see my, my John book, but I think somebody did copy it one time. Uh, several Johns told me that some girl was calling, mentioning my name. Call girls assemble their list of Johns in a variety of ways. Some of them frequent the more exclusive bars and restaurants. It's easy for an attractive, unaccompanied girl to catch the attention of a man on the loose. When she's convinced he's not a vice officer, she'll proposition him. Occasionally, a girl with nothing else to do will permit herself to be picked up and seduced as a speculative business venture. One night I was in this nightclub with a friend, gay friend of mine, and uh, he pointed to this guy at the bar and he said, that's the guy who owns the place. So I had nothing else to do, and well, since I knew it wasn't fuzz and I figured his place was doing pretty good, I thought I'd see if I could hustle him a little. So I went over there and, uh, you know, struck up a conversation, and he seemed pretty impressed. So one thing led to another, and... Anyhow, it ended up with him saying, how about coming over to my place later and listening to my hi-fi. <laughs> so, oh, he was pretty corny. Naturally, <coughs> we uh, ended up spending the night together, and in the morning he drove me back to town and said he had a big business deal, and would I mind taking the cab the rest of the way home? Well, this was fine with me, and <coughs> handed me a five spot, and I said, uh, uh, how this is fine for cab fare, but uh, how about 50 for myself? And he just looked at me, and I said, well, I'm not in this business for my health. And he acted pretty surprised and, you know, got kind of shook up. He said he had no idea I was going to want money, and why didn't I tell him in the first place? And I said, honey, don't you think I was worth 50? I said, you're a big businessman, but there was no sale, and I think his feelings kind of got hurt, you know. So I said to him, okay, okay, thanks for a great evening, got out of the car. There was one time I didn't make out, but lots of guys you pick up that way will come across with some loot. As in any business, getting new customers is only part of the sales job. Keeping the old ones buying is just as difficult, just as demanding. Hello, dear. How are you there? Uh-huh. What you been up to? Oh, usual thing. I mean, you know. Listen, honey. See, I thought you'd help out a friend. Oh, honey, that's all right. Nothing. I'm just having a little drink. Y'all? Well, why don't you invite me over for a drink? You know I can get you in the mood, baby. 
Well, I am, and my rent's going to be due Monday. That's not nasty, baby. I do care about you, and I would like you to be in the mood. Well, I can't be in love with you yet. Come on, baby. Don't you want to see me? You came to my rescue the last time. You know I don't. All right, I'm only asking. You know what I was thinking? Next time I'm going to bring somebody with me, and we're going to have two for one. No, really, baby, she's a doll. Hey, I got a great idea. I've got a book with me I could bring over. You'll flip when you see this book. This one will paint a picture for you. Well, we can put music in the background. Oh, all right, baby. I won't hang you on the phone any longer. I just thought you wanted company. I'm really very nice when you get to know me. What do you mean if I get something? Aren't I enough? Well, what do I have to do? Put you in the mood? I am not blowing my stack, really. I'm smiling every minute I'm talking to you. I got all kinds of goodies. Ideas, you know. But I'm not going to tell you over the phone. You either want to see me or you don't want to see me. All right, all right. If I think of something, I'll call you back. All right, bye. Some Johns are single, many are married. They come in all shapes, sizes, ages, and inclinations. Some are genuinely interested in companionship. Every time this guy was with me, all he wanted to do was talk. I mean, he really didn't want anything else. It got sort of weird after a while, getting paid all that money just to hear him talk. Well, one day I had a little bug and I told him, Stop talking, you're running up your bill! <laughs> Although the majority of Johns are content with a call girl's basic merchandise, some shop for goods a trifle more exotic. I have one John who beats me up a little bit. He beats me with a belt or a whip. I see him quite a lot, and he really used to hurt me quite bad. That was before I caught on to his gimmick. Actually, this guy gets his kicks out of just hearing me scream. So now all I start doing is screaming before he hurts me, and then he stops. Sometimes he marks me up across the back, but not too often. I don't especially like it, but he pays me a hundred. I know another one who just likes you to bow to him, doesn't even touch you. He just sits there with his legs folded, and I have to be dressed in black stockings, black panties, and black high heels. Then he gives me the sign, and I have to bow to him, on my hands and knees, slave time. To him, it's the greatest thing on earth. I think these guys are sick. I met one John that had me dressed like a teenager for him. No lipstick, and I had to wear a ribbon in my hair uh, and make believe like I was complete virgin and hadn't been touched. I if you dressed like a teenager and looked like a teenager, he really liked it. But once you started playing around and acted like you knew something, he, he didn't want to see you anymore. He was, he was always good for a C-note. Sometimes he made me put on a bathing suit with a flimsy top and a puffy skirt. You know, how, how those kids look in the, in the little bathing suits. He likes that little girl look. Even though he likes you to like you well stacked. He has all the clothes and he supplies all the outfits. And before he makes it with you, he tells you exactly what he wants. But he likes the idea that he's making it with a young virgin. He's about 45 years old and a very wealthy man. There's this guy called the Velvet Freak. <laughs> they call him that because he just loves to touch velvet, even more so than the body. He yeah. loves velvet. Well, sometimes I get a call and they'd say, the Velvet Freak wants you. Drop everything and go over there right away. Here's how he'd do it if he called for a new girl. He'd always want one under 22, nothing over 22. Well, the girl would get there and he'd open the door and look. He'd just open it a little way and look. If he didn't approve, he'd shut the door, not even give her cab fare, <laughs> and the girl would be standing there. Well, it was usually these youngies, not very experienced and out there in the middle of nowhere, and he wouldn't even, he wouldn't even let them use the phone. And then the next day, he'd send the lady who sent the girl out $50. Well, the way I met him was I went on a trick with two guys, two gay guys and myself. And we made a, a hundred apiece, and all this guy wanted us to do was walk around in velvet robes and let him feel us. 
Then he made us take our clothes off and walk around, but not for very long. It was a, a short deal, so he really didn't want me. He just wanted one of the guys. So he chose the one he thought was the best and made the other guy and me leave the room. <coughs> Wouldn't even allow us to watch. Money is her chief objective, but occasionally a call girl will draw the line at what she'll do to earn it. There are a lot of things I'll pass up. I don't care how much money's involved. <coughs> There's a lot of things I'll go for, but nothing that's going to hurt me physically. To hell with that. While of the opinion that a call girl had to draw the line somewhere, this girl seemed confused as to exactly where that somewhere was. I don't let guys do to me what I don't want them to do to me. I can push them away from me or, or they'll never respect me. I can always push them aside. There are some places where I won't let a trick touch me. I've had some weirdos, but I've had to kick them out. But naturally, if they pay enough, but if a weirdo offered me enough loot, I'd take care of him myself, but I'd never send another girl in on him. The extravagance of the customer's demands can shock even the most hardened call girls used to just about everything. The weirdest <coughs> scene I ever had was this guy in the casket, a live guy in a casket. I walked into the room and there was this casket with a body in it. <coughs> it moved and I screamed. The guy didn't even want me. He just got his kicks from me screaming. I got a hundred dollars from him. It shocked me, I almost died. Perhaps the most bizarre occurrence is when a call girl hardened to emotion can be reached by one of her customers. When I have sex with tricks, I don't feel anything. But this one guy got me in bed and loved me until I couldn't move. He loved me all over, my legs, my toes, all over. After that guy gives you all that money and then he does that for you. I almost fell apart. I actually didn't like it at first. Honest to God, I didn't. But I had the money, so, well, what could I do? I had to please the customer. After a while, I liked it. I guess my business, I really have to do with a lot of things I don't like. It felt great, but that doesn't mean I liked it. Hollywood is one of the nation's show business capitals, and it's natural that a call girl should occasionally be pressed into service in the interest of the theater. Well, one of my customers calls me and says, I've got another guy I want you to meet. You get 50 and you're going to a party with him. I said, all right, so I went. On the way to the party, the guy says to me in the car, uh, you know, he was one of the, an older guy, about 55, and he frightened me horribly. So he says, when you get there, there's a girl and she's going to make love to you. Oh, huh. I almost fainted. But I was so bashful, I, I would never talk up, because I was too bashful to say no. I was just petrified with everything. But I was going to get 50 from this guy. So I get there, and all these people are there. About 25 people. So all of a sudden, the door opens, and in comes this beautiful little girl. She has a you know real Frenchy suit and a little hat which is unusual out here. A real darling little hat, a, a plaid hat and a plaid purse. She stood there and that was her, but I didn't know. So I thought, isn't she beautiful? I was immediately intrigued. So this guy says to me, go in there and get your clothes off. There she is. <laughs> I said, in front of all these people? Well, we left the party together, and then I stayed with her about three days, and then moved, moved out on my roommate and moved in with this girl. <laughs> and I stayed with her for two years. But after about four months, we became just roommates and friends. We were good friends and roommates. But we had a better relationship when we broke off all that nonsense. You know, it was better than when we were having sex. We just had sex on dates. We couldn't be bothered because we were too close in a, in a friendship way to go home and have sex because that would be ridiculous. <laughs> Occasionally, the call girl's profession confronts her with moments of high comedy. Well, there's this couple that live out in the valley who have a pretty weird scene going. The wife and the husband both like to make it with call girls. Well, one night I got out there and we started drinking and talking and 
Well, I had another John lined up for later on, and I looked at the clock and said, Oh, my God, I'll be late. I've got to cut out. So the wife says, The party's just getting started. Well, everybody was getting real loaded, and when this guy rang the bell, we invited him to join us. None of us had a stitch of clothes on, but too high to care. So the husband takes me in the other room, and while we're in there, the wife makes the guy take everything off and makes it with him. <laughs> She's from French or something with long black hair, and she looks like a starlet. Well, we were ready to leave, and the, the husband pays me off, and the wife comes up to him and says, I had this guy. You've got to pay him, too. So he got 50, and he was a John. Some call girls consider any form of social life a luxury. I occasionally go out socially, but I'm in business to make money, not to play. But most of them seem to feel some form of social recreation is worth the loss in income. Some of them even get married. When Jack married me, he knew I was a hustler, but he didn't care. I think it's impossible for anyone to be in love with a hustler. Jack's all right. He's a traveling salesman. He's away most of the time. And, well, both have our businesses, that's all. But a married call girl is subject to the same matrimonial difficulties as her sisters out of the profession. My husband and I were living together, sharing expenses. He kept what he made, and I kept what I made. He didn't want any money from me. What I did was my business. What he did was his. Then he met this 19-year-old girl and got a quickie divorce and married her. She's a hustler, too, but he didn't turn her out. She was already turned out when he met her, but that's the way he likes it. Perhaps one step removed from the man married to a hustler is the man who lives off her earnings, the pimp. Hustlers themselves are divided as to the exact meaning of the word pimp. Some define him as a kept man who takes no active part in the business of prostitution. Others insist that a pimp's function is to get business for his girl. For reasons peculiar to the psychology of the prostitutes, both groups insist that a pimp is necessary and desirable. How does a man get to be a pimp? When I was working as a bartender in Hollywood, one night this chick comes in and sits at the bar making small talk and drinking. Well, it wasn't a busy night, so I stood around and talked to her. When she left, she tossed me a five for myself. She came back a few times after that, and every time she left me five or more. One time, I think it was a twenty even. Well, I figured she went for me, so one night I asked her for a date. When I picked her up, she started naming the places she wanted to go to, and I, I told her, wait a minute, on my salary, I couldn't even pay the hat check girl at some of those places. Anyway, she said that she didn't expect me to pay for it. Well, of course, she had lots of money, and I went along with the gag, thought she was a rich girl. I mean, you don't ask questions when a chick wants to blow 50 or 100 on you in an evening. Well, after that, we went around pretty steady. She used to meet me after work, but she'd never let me pick up a tab. And then she started buying presents for me. I mean, really expensive presents, like uh, shirts for 25 bucks and things like that. Uh, then one night she says, Baby, what's the sense you working every night? I don't get to see enough of you. So she offers to put me on an allowance, just like that, an allowance. So... Finally, I asked her, I said, Baby, where does all this loot come from? Did you rob a bank or something? No, she says, I thought you knew better. I'm a hustler. Well, I wasn't shocked. I guess I should have known. I'd been around that sort of thing. But she looked uh, so college girl type that I didn't tumble, I guess. Anyway, I wanted to turn her down. But <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you, I was sort of hooked. I mean, where else? Could a guy like me get a hold of money like that? Not every pimp is as genial as the bewildered bartender. I don't call my house regularly, my guy will bash my face in. He's as mean as they come. I buy the groceries, I pay the rent, I pay all the bills. And I've only made it with him once. I don't think he's good enough to be a pimp. <laughs> this guy's using me, that's all. A pimp goes out and gets action. The first week I, I knew him, I dug him, but now he doesn't want me to go out unless I'm making money. I tell him to get out of my house, but I'm not strong enough. In, in my business, you're not going to go and call the cops. 
My pimp would put me down if I didn't get paid for it. His own wife was out doing it. And if she's not getting paid for it, he puts her down. Something terrible. <coughs> it's not because he doesn't love her. It's just that he thinks if a girl's going to go out and sleep with any man, you know, any man around town, she ought to get paid for it. If she loves him, it's a different thing. But not every man in town for nothing. Psychologists tell us that call girls are not motivated purely by the love of money. Every girl who turns over her entire earnings to a pimp bears out the truth of this contention. The call girl feels herself a social outcast and finds comfort and security in knowing that there is someone in the world lower than she, the man who lives off her earnings. For according to our best authorities, the call girl holds an extremely low opinion of herself. Her choice of profession is partially motivated by a need for self-abasement. Cut off forever from the approval of all of society and daily forced to submit to the most profound depravities of which man is capable, it would seem that the call girl, however highly paid, is being cheated.